look at her general dentition, you'll notice that there's more than the veneers that need attention. Look at the cervical of the mandibular anterior teeth. We see the wear associated with those teeth. An occlusal view of the maxilla reveals uh, some more fracture on number three, lingual cusp, secondary caries associated with that. The lingual of the maxillary anterior teeth, typical of a patient, a bulimic type of patient, or you know, with that lingual erosive type of wear. There's no report of bulimia uh, in her history at all. So there's an acid component here, and this is at this point we go into a discussion of the etiology of the acid wear, whether it's extrinsic, in other words, diet, or intrinsic. <clears throat> Very often these patients have GERD, and we need to investigate and prompt them <clears throat> to investigate from their medical practitioners whether GERD is actually a component in this wear. I just had a patient who received a patient report uh, yesterday from a patient who had erosive wear in her mouth and she's been a patient of mine for almost 10 years and we've discussed this GERD component but she absolutely denied it. After 10 years I, I influenced her to go for a, a GI exam and the report came back with esophageal erosion lesions and uh, the presence of uh, gastritis. So we need to encourage our patients to look into the potential intrinsic etiology of erosive type of wear. So this is how this patient presents. Occlusal view of the mandible. <clears throat> Here's the finished treatment of tooth number six. And as the time goes on, a couple months later, uh, Mark gets into the case and he starts to uh, provisionalize the maxillary right posterior area and finds extensive caries that he's concerned about. So that becomes an immediate concern, still without looking at, you know, from my perspective, the entire case, I examine two and four. So just to get, put you in perspective as to what's going on with the patient, the initial therapy phase started out with the caries control, Canberra protocol, oral hygiene protocol, and obviously caries control. And this is where we're at in the case. We, I'm starting to do caries management, caries cleanup quadrant by quadrant and this is and this is where uh, Terry is involved at this point. Carry on Terry. So now it's a little bit more of an extensive uh, multi-tooth exam looking at the entire maxillary <laughs> right quadrant. You know appears to be caries exposures in teeth number two and four. To get the caries control under <coughs> underway and um, you know not have you know painful in incidents with inflamed pulps we go ahead and treat two and four. There's the treatment of tooth number four and the treatment of tooth number two. Now, interestingly, with chronic pulp stimulation, you'll sometimes see some external inflammatory resorption. So I was a little bit concerned. Um, the distal buccal and palatal roots are kind of normal, but there's a little bit of external root in resorption on the MB root. Now we get into the case further. A month later, Mark starts provisionalizing the rest of the mouth. And you say, well, it's about time to perform a full mouth endodontic evaluation. So, yeah, as I'm getting into the case and, and noted, noting the nature of the decay in the patient's mouth, the soft dentin that seems to track deep, you know, lingual caries on the molars. Um, so I'm getting a, an idea that this is not superficial caries. Everything is tracking deep, and I'm saying, look, this, is, this case is extending into much bigger um, situation and that's where we at with Terry at this point I'm thinking well we just need a comprehensive exam on the case. One point I want to make is once uh, when a full mouth reconstruction is being performed it's really nice to have the teeth uh, provisionalized um, before examining them endodontically otherwise you're guessing what's going on underneath metal restorations. And here's some dynamic slicing with the CT you can see by being able to look at these teeth that have been provisionalized in 3D, you can kind of see, you know, if there's some gross pulp exposures and some areas that may look like, you know, there's a pulp exposure on a traditional 2D radiograph may not really be a pulp exposure when examining it in 3D. But in this case, we looked at that, um, you know, number 18 tooth, and it looked like it clearly was close to the pulp and would be wise to do the endodontics on the 18 tooth. And we just kind of did a stitch scan with the care stream scanner of the whole maxillary arch. And, you, you know, there's the teeth we ended up treating. 
on the maxillary right side, and we had not yet treated the, the other teeth. Yeah, at this point, so, you know, the sequencing of treatment at this point is caries control, endodontic treatment. So I have these short-term provisionals. These are just duplicates of her original teeth in this phase of treatment, and I'll do the core uh, buildups, and each will go into the details later, the, the thought process that's involved in the core buildups, whether the teeth need posts or not, and what kind of material. Do we want a material with high compressive strength, high tensile strength, high modulus of elasticity, and that all depends on the remaining tooth structure we'll talk about in a while. And very often, <clears throat> I'll use an existing short-term provisional as a matrix, in this case number 18, I've used the provisional as a matrix to pack amalgam, and we used, if you noticed, I just used uh, some of the post pace and uh, pulp chamber for retention, which avoided using a post I try to avoid posts as much of, as often as I can, and we'll go into that a little later. But this is just this initial phase of therapy. Caries clean out, endodontic treatment with sealing and coronal sealing with cores and buildups, and, and uh, Terry carries on with uh, the rest of the mouth. It was very unusual, the soft dentin that this woman had. Even going deep and into the, you know, pupil sealing, the caries was deep and the dentin was soft all the way through. This is a big concern to me. You can see with the Explorer here drying it. It's very crusty, uh, very caries prone, this woman. Here's uh, entry into the pulp chamber space. Uh, just, I don't like this kind of stained dentin. <laughs> it's, uh, this is a problem for this woman. You can see the dark brown uh, infected dentin. And so I, I used a lot of caries indicator dye to make sure that uh, there was no remaining, um, you know, caries in this case. Here's the completion. Here she is in a full occlusal view <clears throat> where she's been prep, pre prepped. Notice the different materials I've viewed for foundation and core. Some cases amalgam, some cases core paste, others light cured composite resin. So some of the studies by Cho and Donovan from 99, <clears throat> comparing core, core materials from the perspective of compressive strength and diametral tensile strength, have shown that the light-cured hybrid composite materials can compare in compressive strength to amalgam, to a high copper amalgam like Valium. The core paste, in other words, the, the auto-cure flowable paste materials that are much easier to use flow into the core do not exhibit as much of the, that compressive strength. <clears throat> so you need to consider how much support you're getting from your remaining tooth structure when you're making these decisions. This is a highly intellectual process that one needs to go, to, go through. It's not a cookbook of one technique is the best technique because we don't have the science, we don't have the literature to show us that there is a panacea. We have to intellectualize on every single tooth, and one needs to be in concert with the treating members of the team, the endodontist or the orthodontist and all the other members at all times. <clears throat> Here she is, provisionalized full arch maxilla. At this point, we're moving forward. We've opened up the vertical. I haven't provisionalized the mandibular anterior, but it shows you what I've done here just to aid the orthodontist in releasing these teeth to uncouple the anterior and achieve our goals of function in the anterior and the patient's mouth. So if you apply these principles to the endodontic tooth, you can almost transfer them, them right over. You look at the endodontic tooth, you want to look at the biomechanical structural status of each individual abutment. Where is this tooth functionally in the patient's mouth? Is it a cuspid? Is it a second molar taking multi-directional more force? Is it a lateral incisor, the least traffic tooth in the mouth? And will the occlusion allow you to control the forces on this tooth? What is the periodontal status of that tooth? How much attachment support do we have? <clears throat> and lastly, the aesthetic value of that tooth, obviously pertaining to the anterior with regards to discoloration, very often found in endodontically treated teeth. <clears throat> so from a structural perspective, we need to evaluate what is our remaining sound tooth structure. I think this is the one component in evaluating prognosis, 
the most important component because <clears throat> that will directly affect the longevity and prognosis of a tooth. <clears throat>